So I'm going to announce our first speaker. Um, in this first round, each speaker will have 10 minutes to share their thoughts about BDS. Our first speaker is Rebecca Belcomerson, who's the National Director for Jewish Voice for Peace. Rebecca lived in Israel from 2006 to 2009, where she worked for a Palestinian-Israeli public policy center and a Bedouin Jewish environmental rights organization. Good evening, everybody. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm just so glad this conversation is happening, um, and I think it's exactly the kind of conversation we should be having, both inside the Jewish community and, and also outside of it. Um, Adam introduced the basic tenets of BDS, and I want to emphasize that the BDS movement is actually quite broad and decentralized, and how it's implemented is very much dependent on the local context. So I think between Han and myself, you're going to hear some of the varieties of tactics and histories that bring us to be part of this movement. Um, in my case, and I'm in a little bit of a different position than some of the other speakers here because I'm the director of an organization and I'm sort of also representing my organization here, I want to talk specifically about how we at Jewish Voice for Peace came to believe that BDS has the most potential to build a movement that has the power to create a truly just peace, um, one that provides equality, human rights, safety, security, and freedom for all the people of Israel and Palestine, both Jewish and Palestinian. Um, so here's our analysis of the situation. The peace process has been going on for 19 years. Um, it has functioned, in effect, um, as a way for Israel to consolidate and permanently annex the occupied Palestinian territories. So really, in a way, the, pa the peace talks are actually perpetuating the occupation as more and more settlements and roadblocks are built as the peace process goes on and as human rights are being violated every day. And this has actually been part of the Israeli strategy from the very beginning regardless of party. So I actually just want to share two little quotes that I dug up. One's from um, Prime Minister Shamir, who lost the elections in 1992. And he said, I would have conducted peace negotiations for 10 years, and in the meantime, we would have reached half a million souls in Judea and Samaria, that's the West Bank. Um, without such a basis, there would be nothing to stop the establishment of a Palestinian state. Okay, so you could say he's a Likudnik, he was always in the right wing, uh, but we have the, the peacemakers on the other side of the Israeli spectrum. I have another quote from uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who of course is known as one of the greatest Palestinian, uh, excuse me, Israeli, <laughs> one of the greatest Israeli peacemakers. And one of the, something that he said um, was, for all its faults, labor has done more and remains capable of doing more in the future in expanding Jewish settlements than we could with all of its doings. We have never talked about Jerusalem. We have just made it a fate accompli. It was we who built the suburbs in the annexed part of Jerusalem. The Americans didn't say a word because we built those, sub those suburbs cleverly. So this is, you know, you, there's a lot of talk about labor Likud, which, you know, which parties in Israel are the peace parties, but really this has been a strategy throughout the 19 years of the peace talks. It's really been about continuing to build settlements, creating facts on the ground, um, while the peace process drags on and on, the peace process drags on and on. So then we want to turn to the U.S. and what the role of the U.S. is. Um, the U.S. likes to call itself an honest broker, but really it's been anything but. Um, new aid packages and enticements continue to be offered to the Israelis, even as more and more settlements have been, are being built. In this most recent round of peace talks, although Israel continually rejected even a partial temporary settlement freeze that they didn't even follow, um, 87 senators signed an APAC letter saying that the peace talks should continue without preconditions. So when we look at and analyze where we are and how much power we actually have to have influence on that process, we have, to, we have to be honest with ourselves and say we simply don't have the power to influence the process at this, movement, at, at this moment, and we're doing everyone a disservice if we pretend that we do. So based on that, looking at that factor, the worsening human and civil rights situation on the ground, um, the decades-long peace talks, which have only entrenched the Israelis, um, and the U.S. government unwillingness or inability to intervene in any real way to create negotiation conditions that would be in true equal partnership as the negotiations took place. The only thing that can really change the dynamic is to build a powerful movement that will force um, the U.S. government to take into account um, these, these factors when they're, when they're making their policies. So in favor of, the, of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, um, first of all, the BDS movement is a non-violent response to the ongoing and structural violence of Israel's relationship to Palestinians, and it's a response to the ongoing violations of Palestinian rights. 
Um, and perhaps even more importantly, it's a roadmap that can work. It's a way for individual people to peacefully act on their own values. And it's been used in some of the most noble civil rights struggles of our days. I read a book recently about the end of the slave trade um, in England in the 1790s. At that point, they, at some point, they had 300,000 people boycotting sugar that was coming from the slave colonies. Um, of course, Gandhi used it in the, in the struggle against England, um, in our own civil rights struggles here in the United States, and of course in South Africa. So here we have a, um, a proven tactic, a proven nonviolent tactic, a way that citizens can express their opinions about policies. And I think that's, and it can be implemented all over the world. So we have groups in Israel that are advocating boycott, we have groups all over Europe, and now we, have, and we also have groups in the U.S., and of course, of all coming, emanating from the Palestinian call. And also, PDS allows us as Jews to act on our Jewish values. I really see this work as being in line with the values of justice and freedom that I cherish from the Jewish tradition. Um, so we at JVP you know, proudly consider ourselves part of the, of the BDS mo movement, um, and yet we focus exclusively on the occupied territories in our campaigns, and just a couple, and although we defend the right of people to, to, to choose full BDS actions, there's a huge range of those kinds of different tactics. Um, just a couple quick examples of some of the, the campaigns that JVP has promoted. Um, in the fall, you may have known that there was a bunch of Israeli um, artists who refused anymore to perform in Ariel or the other occupied settlements. Um, we were able to we we were able to support that form of cultural boycott by getting about 200 um, Broadway and Hollywood and all kinds of theater scholars and other um, performance artists, some really um, great names, um, to support that action of the, of those of those Israeli artists. Um, and our own main team campaign is to get TI and CREF, which is one of the biggest pension funds in the United States, to divest from the occupied, to, to divest from companies that are profiting from the occupied territories. Um, and I, I want to sort of close with a comment on the definition of Jewish community, which, which Adam touched on, and about the suppression of dissent in the community. Um, two weeks ago, I was at a protest um, that was called in support of the boycott of Ahava products at Ripley's. Um, those are beauty products that are made by exploiting the natural resources in the Palestinian territories. So it's another good example of a campaign that specifically focused on the occupied territories, which makes sense in this American sort of still hostile, although changing um, context. Um, and at that rally, we were there specifically as Jews in support of the boycott. We had children, like eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and their parents, um, some of the time they were screaming at us, not one inch, not one inch, but much of the time they were screaming, you're not a Jew, you're not a Jew, you're not a Jew. And I found this to be such an incredibly disturbing experience, um, and I wanted to scream back at them. I, we had agreed with the organizers that we weren't going to get into a screaming match, so I didn't. But what I wanted, you know, I wanted to scream back at them about having been bumped to it in the synagogue that my grandparents founded, and the synagogue that I belong to, and the fact that my husband is Israeli, is Israeli my children are, is, uh, children are Israeli, and that I lived in Israel. I didn't say any of that. Um, so at the same time that I was, uh, would really strongly assert that those of us who favor BDS are part of the Jewish community, I would also say that all people have the right to advocate for these positions, whether they're Jewish or not, and that those positions deserve to be treated with respect, whether you agree with them or not. BDS is a legitimate, nonviolent way to work for justice, and that's why I'm really proud to be a part of it. <laughs>